Okay, so into the main part of the conference. Our first session is called Our Changing Climate, and we're really um, happy to welcome Dr Pandora Hope here to deliver her, her talk on the changing climate of South Coast Western Australia. Dr Pandora Hope is a research scientist from the Bureau of Meteorology based in head office in Melbourne, but don't hold that against her. She's studied the climate variability of southern and southwest WA through her involvement in the Indian Ocean and Climate Initiative since 2002. More recently, she helped with the production of the new climate change projections for NRM, leading the writing of the report for the southern and southwestern flatlands cluster. She will now tell us about that report, guide us through the Climate Change in Australia website and describe some of her own work on climate of the region. Thanks, Pandora. Thank you. When I was told that I could come back here to speak to you again, I was very excited at the prospect and uh, even more so that it was kindly funded. Thank you very much. Um, so as um, was mentioned, I've worked on the climate of uh, the wider southwest region, if we think the southwest goes from Geraldton to Esperance. <laughs> Um, since about 2002 as part of the Indian Ocean Climate Initiative. So we started that project back in 98, thinking that the Indian Ocean drove a lot of the climate variability in Western Australia. And also to kind of draw some of the uh, focus away from the Pacific Ocean, which the people over east seem to think drives everything. So we started doing research in that region. And another... Um, so on the... Top left there is a poster I produced back in 2008, just looking at the decadal variability in the rainfall across the region and seeing that at the various rainfall recording stations, there's actually different variability. So the region, even though we were looking at sort of an average, there's lots of variability across the whole region, as I'm sure you're well aware. I was very excited also to come again because I thought I would take the time to visit my sister in Perth, who's over in the back corner there, and drive with her down here through, um, well, she was a bit surprised when I said, let's, let's turn left off the highway and go and visit Wagen. So we did. And I got to see the wheat belt, which I've spoken about a lot and never actually been to. So I was very excited. She thought I was a bit strange, but yes. Um, so that was very good. But today... Uh, unlike last time, we've now finished the projections for NRM project and I'll just talk uh, mostly about the output which has been this website. Now there's all sorts of other uh, printed documents and unfortunately I left my bag of those back in Melbourne but um, I'm sure we'll get some of those over to you. We've got some great little discs that actually have the printed documents on them which are really good. So this is the front landing page and we have all sorts of um, places getting started and a decision tree about where you might go in this website. So that's what the decision tree looks like and I think what we're trying to make the point is that sometimes you actually need quite simple information. You might just want to know a little bit more about the climate drivers of your region, in which case you might go to this climate campus area. You might want projections, but you might only want just a change factor to apply to your own observed series. And, and this website will provide simpler results and more complex results right down to getting into the actual data from the climate models. Now, before I jump into the website, I'll step back a little bit and talk about the um, aspects that vary the weather and climate where you live. So, of course, you know... You get fronts coming through, you get blocking highs, you get northwest cloud bands, cut off lows, lots of interesting things bring vari variations in your weather, sea breezes, for instance. But on longer time scales, what influences how your weather actually uh, is impacting in your region? On very long time scales, if we're talking about thousands of years, we have changes in how the Earth. Um, is positioned with respect to the sun. And that was believed to have driven the ice ages over the last hundreds of thousands of years. The sun is very important, of course, to us. If we sort of turn the sun off one day, our climate would vary dramatically. Um, and it, it can 
what I find really, sorry, an aside, I find really interesting at the Bureau of Meteorology now we have the Ion Ionospheric Prediction Centre. And so I go along to their monthly meetings and they tell us about these coronal ejections that might have shut down all our electricity grids for three years, and, but it missed us. So, you know, it's really fascinating. The sun, you know, certainly influences what's going on. And, of course, it has its own decadal variability, but the changes that the input from the sun make to our climate are actually quite small. Volcanic eruptions can have a big impact. So back in uh, the early 90s, I started skiing, and there was amazing snow near the hills of Melbourne. And um, I realised it was Mount Pinatubo cooling down the whole climate for about two years. So that's what volcanic eruptions can do, but it's a short-lived effect. Changes in greenhouse gases, on the other hand, really um, take these small changes and, and sort of build them up into uh, feedbacks to really enhance the signal that we're seeing. And they can change on the order of hours to centuries because we have a range of greenhouse gases, including water vapour. So if it rains, then you have a very different level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. One long-lived uh, greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide. And so that's something that in the Climate Change in Australia website and our climate modelling, we consider that because that's what we know about as a constant. So quickly, going into the greenhouse effect, which most of you will know all about, the sun provides us with energy. It comes in. Not all of it reaches the surface. Quite a bit is reflected, about half, or scattered in the atmosphere. And once it reaches the Earth, it turns into heat. And that heat then starts to come back out again, if we follow this arrow here. And some of that is actually uh, reabsorbed and re-emitted back to Earth by these greenhouse gases. So greenhouse gases, they let the sunlight in, but they don't let the heat out. And that is a good thing, because it means that our Earth, if we didn't have those, would be minus 18 degrees on average globally. And at the moment, it's a nice, comfortable plus 15, so we can actually live here. And uh, that's a good thing. One thing that we've uh, noticed is that with increasing greenhouse gases, less is escaping out to space again and more is being reabsorbed and recirculated back in our lower atmosphere. So things are starting to warm up. If we have a look at the amount of greenhouse gases, we all have seen this graph before, I'm sure. This is 800,000 years ago. These are from records of the ice down in Antarctica, little bubbles of air in that ice showing us the carbon dioxide measurements through those hundreds of years. Here we have the glacial cycles, which they believe are driven by those changes in the uh, Earth's aspect to the sun and then enhanced by the responses of the uh, feedbacks with the greenhouse gases. In recent times, we've gone off the charts. So obviously that's going to have some impact. So we'll talk about what impact that's been having now, and you can see that through some of the results in the website. But we also want to think about what impact we're going to have into the future, because you, of course, want to do planning. And so we can think about various, um, various scenarios of how our emissions will evolve, because we can control the emissions that humans make, and, um, and our agriculture, etc. So we follow... Uh, back in the IPCC fourth assessment report, there were a range of scenarios, A1, uh, B, B1. And in the more recent uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment, uh, AR5, there are different scenarios here, including one called RCP 2.6, which is down here, this purple one, which includes not only a complete shut-off of emission, but also drawing some of the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and sequestering it. So that's quite a dramatic mitigation scenario. Uh, this red one up the top here, although it looks like the top of the range at the moment, we're still tracking along that in terms of our emissions. So we take this information, how the uh, greenhouse gases are varying, and we put it into a climate model. Back when I started uh, studying applied mathematics, we take the um, equations of motion of the atmosphere and we try and simulate the weather. So that's where 
general circulation models, which are now currently called global climate models. Luckily, the acronym matches, GCMs. Um, just the atmosphere, and we started to think, well, actually, we'd like to know how the oceans are moving as well. So we started to include the equations of motion of the ocean and start to couple those together. We also included uh, parameterizations of the rainfall, the clouds, the ice. The cryosphere is a very important component of our global climate system. And some of the more recent models are actually including changes in the uh, chemistry as well, which of course has interactions with the whole system as we know it. So can these models simulate the climate? On a very broad scale, because these are quite broad scale um, simulations, sometimes of the order of 150 kilometre grid squares. This is the global average climate in the black. You can see what we have observed in the blue. If we don't include changes in greenhouse gases, that's the simulation of the global temperature of the surface of the Earth that we get. And you can see it's a little bit cool in the last... So this is 1910, 2010. So in the last 50 years or so, it's a little bit cool. If we actually inclu include the observed changes in greenhouse gases, and we have good records of those, you can see that it gets that red line there, which completely encompasses what we've observed. So we're doing pretty well with these GCMs. If we then want to think about, well, what's happening in this part of Australia, we come right down, but of course they're very large uh, grid cells, these 150 kilometre grid cells. So how do we make sort of an average? How do we decide what air, where we're going to cut Australia up? So we first of all have a look at the major, major seasonal rainfall zones of Australia. And you can see along the west coast there with Perth, you have very winter-dominated uh, rainfall regime and relatively high rainfall. And the, oops, sorry. And the rainfall here in Albany is actually quite similar in an annual average to Perth, but you get a bit more in summer, as I'm sure you're all well aware. So this lighter blue is um, slightly less winter-dominated, but still quite strongly winter-dominated. So that's one way to cut things up. Another way might be just to include all the NRM regions from the southwest corner. There we go. So that's actually what we've done in the projections for NRM project, uh, which I shall run you through the um, website. So we have this southern and southwestern flatlands region. Now, that's a name that was just given to me to work with, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I wasn't that keen on the name, but there you go. And this particular region here is the western part of it. So there's an acronym, it's SSWFW. What a great acronym. So as you're going through the website, you see that acronym, you know you're in this part of Australia. So we evaluate our models. Is it at least getting the seasonal cycle of temperature, for instance, over that region? And if we have a look in the red, you can see January there on the left, winter here in the middle, warm in January, cool in winter, yay. <laughs> the models are doing all right. If we have a look at the uh, rainfall, which is somewhat harder for the models to actually capture. And you can see in here, we've got January over here on the left, very low rainfall over the region coming up in winter, as you all know. And the models, most of them do okay. They're capturing that uh, peak in winter rainfall, but in summer, some of them, or in sort of late summer, early autumn, some of them are getting this extra kick. And so what that means is that the averaging region is a little bit far, um, including a little bit too much of the tropical influence from the north. And, you know, these are large-scale systems in these general circulation models, in these global climate models. They're global. And so coming down to this tiny scale, we have to think about the biases that these models have in them. They're including a little bit of information from too far north. So going back to the website, what can we see there? Well, I'll just run you through a few of the tools. And uh, one really good thing about me coming down here is I got to actually use this website. When we came down last time, it wasn't in existence yet. We were just talking about all the products we were building, the reports we were writing, and now I can actually play with the website. So it's good. So um, this is not online. These are just snapshots that I've grabbed off my computer. And I would encourage you, if you haven't, to actually go and play with this yourself. So climatechangeinaustralia.org.au. 
So from this website, Regional Climate Change Explorer, you can select down here subclusters because that's what you want. You want the Southern and Southwest Flatlands West subcluster. So that's this region here. And you have key messages. I wonder if I can read them out to you. I'm sure you all know what they are. Uh, your average temperature will continue to increase in all seasons with high confidence. Um, how can I get this a bit closer? No. More hot days and warm spells are projected with very high confidence. Fewer frosts. That's one aspect of this that I think we really still need to work on. So this is just a change factor applied to the current climate, and I don't think that's accurate. If you've got a drying climate, you may well get increased chance of frosts. Um, someone I'm working with at the moment, we're working on a uh, statistical downscaling method to actually apply appropriate downscaling, which hasn't been done yet. So we're still working on the science behind this stuff. So the frosts, although we say it with high confidence, the way it's been calculated, I'm not happy with. So take that information on. A continuation of the trend of decreasing winter rain is projected with high confidence. This is one area of the world where that is true. Uh, spring rainfall decreases are also projected with high confidence, but changes in the other seasons are unclear. Increased intensity of extreme rainfall events is projected with high confidence. I found this is an amazing result right across Australia, even in areas with strong rainfall reductions like here. The intensity of the most extreme rainfall events was projected to increase. I guess when you add extra energy into the system, that's not surprising. You've got more moisture in the air with warmer temperatures, more vigorous storms from the extra energy, so you're going to get more intense storms. Uh, mean, sea level, mean sea level will continue to rise and the height of extreme sea level events will also increase. A harsher fire weather climate, not surprisingly, and on an annual and decadal basis, natural variability in the climate must of course still be considered in the near term. However, for this part of the world, it's one region where very high model consensus on force drying during the observed period in the near term. So for everywhere else in Australia, we can say in the next 30 years or so, natural climate variability might mask what's going on uh, due to climate change, but not here. So uh, you can then bury down right into uh, rainfall and a little bit more detail about that, including past rainfall trends. And I kept asking John Clark, who was guiding me through this website, and you can call him up at CSIRO. He's still working on this uh, outputs from this project. What about actually burying down into what's happening in Albany? And he said, well, you can have a look at the Climate Analogues Explorer. So these are all the locations. And I clicked on Albany, and it gave me the average averages that have been observed at the moment. Uh, I hope they're right an annual average rainfall of 876 millimetres. That seems pretty wet. That's good. <laughs> um, and then we can think about in the current climate, what other stations have a similar climate to Albany? And when you first bring this up, it just is looking at annual rainfall and annual temperature. And it, of course, finds all these sites over in the east that are analogues to Albany. But then if you come here to this seasonal difference, aspect and you say actually I want the percentage of rainfall in summer to be matched to a uh, with a with an error estimate uh, over here which you can vary and suddenly it's only in the southwest of WA that you get those matches so if you're playing with this tool I would highly recommend that you do um, check those boxes down the bottom there to really get into um, regions that have a similar climate, seasonal climate variability. If we then look into the future, so I've chosen a, uh, the RCP 8.5, which was that higher um, projection into the future at 2050, and this is a model that has the maximum consensus um, across the different models. What will the climate of Albany be like? And it's jumped across to Esperance. So it'll get a bit warmer and a bit drier. So thinking about other 
tools on this website that might be able to drill down into local information. Uh, thresholds calculator. And so I had a look at um, how many days above, above, what did I choose? 30, 35 degrees. And apparently, these days on average, you get about two per year. So if we then look into the future, and we, uh, I've chosen a particular model, and I'll get into a bit more detail about how you choose a model in a minute. And I've chosen again that RCP 8.5, that higher level uh, emission scenario, at 2050 for the annual season. And uh, of course, if you choose annual, it's most likely the results will be from summer. Uh, and into the future of about um, 35 years hence, we get about four days above 35. Some of this is fairly simple scaling on the observed time series. Um, the scaling for temperature is relatively simple. The scaling for rainfall is actually a bit more complicated um, because we actually scale uh, by decile. So the lower decile is scaled to itself and then it, the extremes are also scaled separately. So the rainfall is done in a little bit more complex way. Now from this, you can actually download the data and you can download it, sorry, yeah, no, you can download it and you can select the region that you're looking at and the information you're wanting. And uh, if you do download it and you're wondering what NAN stands for, it stands for not a number. So in that particular part of the results, uh, for whatever reason, whether it's a divide by zero or something like that, you won't get information there. The Map Explorer, I thought, was quite interesting. So these are direct model outputs from the global climate models. This is temperature in summer. And uh, it's from, again, that particular HADGEM model, so just one model for the season December to February, as I said, summer, the period 2050, uh, and again, that higher RCP scenario and the change that we can expect across the region. And I like this map because you can really see that although the whole region is a two degree warmer increase, that varies by location. So I, I quite like this. Now, you can also download these grids directly if, if that's the sort of thing you really need. And again, those biases are still in there. So, so do understand that, okay? These are large scale climate models. Um, you may want to reduce down the size by latitude and longitude, which you can do in there. You can, you can select out exactly the area that you want because there is a two megabyte limit on your downloads. Uh, if we have a look at the winter rainfall change, that's even more emphatic. And uh, again, in the same period, 2050, the higher RCP 8.5, that same HADGEM model for winter rainfall, we have for this model, a minus 17.5% uh, decrease averaged across the whole southern and southwest flatlands west region. Uh, but again, you can see that there is spatial variability across that, not as much as with the temperature though. Over here, these dots, these actually represent the responses from the whole range of 40 different models that we've looked at. So this is information that is quite useful you can see actually they're all going pretty much for a reduction across the region. As I said, you can download this data and it is in a uh, format, NetCDF format, that is readable by most GIS programs. And other formats are available off the website directly. If you need help, you can also ring up John Clark and annoy him. Uh, so selecting models and selecting the scenario that you're interested in. Now, I was having a look at one of the um, uh, reports assimilating this information, and, and they were making the point that if you are using a change factor for rainfall and for temperature, you may want to just choose one model so that that's consistent across that model because these models create a whole weather system, a whole climate system, so you do want that consistency. So most of the models, if we have a look at the full range of 40 and this actually includes a few extra ones where we've downscaled the results to a finer scale. And you can see this is the uh, projection, again, RCP 8.5 at 2050. This is warmer here and hotter here, so 1.5 to 3 degrees warmer. And then they're clustered uh, 
compared to rainfall, again, little change, drier and much drier. And you can see much drier and much hotter, sorry, and hotter, 12 of the 41 models, so 25% are going for that situation there. But you may want to think, well, I want to know a range of scenarios to put into my impacts model. And so you might have a look at this one, warmer but actually wetter. Okay, what you can also do is you can drill down and have a look at which particular models are filling that box. And the scientists behind all this have done some good research to think, well, is that a reliable model? And what we find if we click on that CSIRO, so this is a downscaled model, uh, CCAM, and uh, it says, unexplained inconsistencies among the downscaled and host model results lead to low confidence in these downscaled results. Do not select as a representative model. So that's from the technical report, that large technical volume. And uh, that is relevant to the southern and southwest flatlands region. So you might actually discard that as a potential scenario. What I think is going on with this, um, partic as an aside, with this particular downscaling model is it takes the ocean change from the large scale climate models and then runs just an atmosphere at a very fine resolution but I think it takes too much information from that warming ocean and it just kind of rains everywhere because it's hotter. So I think that that's the problem with this particular downscaling um, model and we're still working on that. And as I said, we're still working on getting that statistical downscaling results out there as well, which will come out on the five kilometre grid of the AWAP data. So that's very exciting, but that's in the future still. The ocean results. Now these, so I've just been to the greenhouse 2015 conference which was the last one of the Australian climate change science program which has been running for 27 years and uh, the funding just ended unfortunately um, we have a, a little bit under a different project to go forward but a lot of the marine results and the uh, results in the cryosphere are just just they really make me shocked that changes that have already happened in those environments um, are quite dramatic Anyway, we carry on. Um, so this is a projection of the sea level change in, uh, again, 2050, RCP 8.5. And you can see in these blue colours here, you're looking at about a 0.25 um, centimetre increase in, uh, sorry, 0.25 millimetre, a quarter of a metre increase in sea level in the region. And you can see these little points here. They're like uh, representative tide gauge um, estimates. And the nearest one is aspirants. And we can see here, I just, oh, I can't read that myself. Sorry. Anyway, you have various uh, fields here, including sea allowance, which is how, how much you need to build up your shoreline structure to actually only get inundated as often as you do now. And so this is a new development, so you can get your sea level, but you can also have a look at these sea allowances. Ocean acidification is another thing that um, I think is just a, an incredible response to this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, is the ocean sucking it up. Uh, about 30% of the carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere over the past 200 years has been absorbed by the oceans, so uh, quite a lot. And as it comes into the ocean, it, it alters the, the pH, the acidity of the water. And uh, carbonate um, is used in conjunction with calcium as aragonite by many marine organisms, such as corals, oysters, clams, some plankton, such as foraminifera, and pteropods to form their hard skeletons or shells. And I've shown slides that in the Southern Ocean, the region where these... Um, Plankton can actually survive is, is becoming much smaller. So a reduction in shell mass has already been detected in foraminifera and pteropods in the Southern Ocean. Now that's what whales eat. There's a whole ecosystem based around these little critters. And I'm trying to think, um, I was looking at some reports using these projections saying best case, worst case scenario. And I'm thinking, well, are you actually just talking about least amount of change, most amount of change? But I think in this situation, I'm not really sure who, advantage, who gets an advantage from this change in pH. Um, perhaps jellyfish. So I don't know who has good jellyfish recipes, but anyway. Uh, so we have maps also of the ocean acidification around the region. 
And you can see around here that it's a relatively strong response and uh, you can see the tables up there for the Esperance um, tide gauge site. Uh, in terms of sea level, I might, do I have time to tell you a little story about sea level? So I was told by these uh, oceanographers, as I said, I'm an atmospheric scientist. That's where I started looking at the dynamics of how the atmosphere moves. So I'm fascinated by this oceanography stuff. And they were saying that um, as uh, Greenland melts, it gets a little bit lighter. So it doesn't have as strong a gravity. And so the, the ice, the water that comes off, our, off Greenland, it actually moves away from Greenland. It's not as attracted to Greenland as it once was because Greenland's not as heavy. So the gravity is not as strong. So it moves away, 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 away to the furthest point on the globe, which is, oh, Australia. <laughs> so great. If Greenland goes, we get flooded. Fantastic. Anyway, just a little aside. So there's also all sorts of printed materials. So that was the website, just a really quick ticky tour of a lot of the uh, tools that you have, but there's so much more there. Decision trees, examples of um, various regions that have used this information. Lots and lots of uh, great avenues for research there. Printed material. So this is um, actually a special edition from the Australian Meteorological and Oceanographic Journal that is available. You can all go onto the Bureau's website, so www.bom.gov.au slash amoch, and you can find this special issue about the papers, the scientific papers coming out from the uh, Projections for NRM project. So this is one that I was involved with because we really wanted to pin down the seasonal variability in the rainfall change. So seasonal averages are all good and well, but we actually went down to the monthly time scale. And we can see that um, there seems to be a difference between the trends that we're seeing with that big rainfall de reduction in um, autumn, early winter, which doesn't seem to align with what's been projected here. So this over here is starting in January. So here is your autumn. And the spring seems to be the season that has the major declines. And we found that a little bit unusual. Although in the last three years, I'm wondering if perhaps there's some signal kicking in that we just haven't seen in the observe record yet. So that's certainly an area for further research. And I'm actually shifting into that area of the attribution of extreme events, which seems to be the latest and greatest interest at the moment. Um, happy to talk about that later. Other work, other results in the printed material is, for instance, the uh, mean sea level pressure changes. So in the yellow there is increases in mean sea level pressure, which seems to be just about everywhere, of the end of the century, minus 1985 to 2005, at the highest um, scenario that we have. And you can see in winter, you're just getting higher pressure everywhere as you would expect with decreases in rainfall across southern Australia. So these basic variables are in the technical report and also in the papers that are in that special issue. And in the, um, actually I don't think this slide particularly is in the southern and southwest flatland uh, cluster report. So my suggestion is on that website, register. That's a simple process. Remember you've got a two megabyte limit, so uh, cut down your region if you really want that data, but think about what you do want. If you just want a change factor or um, if you actually do want to drill down to that data. I do have a bit of time, I believe. Thank you. So I thought I would also talk about observed climate and variability in the region and think about um, those differences that there are across the region. You know, it isn't a homogeneous average region, which is why I wanted John Clark to show me how we can drill down to this area away from that uh, wider average, including all the NRM regions across the southwest of Australia. And uh, so the very first thing we look at, of course, is the average rainfall in winter along here on the west, very, very high, and a little bit less in Albany, even though the annual average is about the same as Perth. And of course, that aligns with a little bit more rainfall in summer. So that's the first thing you notice that's different about the west coast and the south coast. And if we have a look at the uh, rainfall over the last five years, you can also see, well, actually, that average across, you know, Geraldton to Esperance 
is not too bad in terms of comparing it with the rest of Australia, <laughs> which had those amazing floods back through uh, the 2010 to 2012 period. And so the average over the last five years of rainfall compared to um, the previous record shows that this area of the world is, is drying, although Albany, it's not a record, thankfully. <laughs> it's not drying as much as the West Coast. So we start to look at the trends. So the 45-year trend from 1970 till now. And you can see, again, there's drying on the west, not quite so much on the south, although it's still drying. So we have a look at the temperature trend. This is in maximum temperature in summer. And you can see, again, it's warming up there on the west. But actually down here, there's some interesting cooling trends over the last 45 years, which, which I find quite interesting. Um, I was talking to Blair Truen before I came. Now, he's sort of the keeper of the information about climate stations across Australia in his head. He's quite an amazing guy at the Bureau of Meteorology. And I'm saying, so in Albany, there's some, there's some interesting differences in the temperatures from the coast to the inland. And he said, yeah, the gradients are really hard to work with. <laughs> you know, you really have... Uh, a lot of difficulty in um, making a cohesive map like this absolutely perfect because you really do have um, rapid gradients in this region. But it seems like a, a robust signature. There has been cooling in summer in the maximum temperature, which surprised me. So I started to think, well, why, why is this? So if we think about what brings systems to the region, if you think about this is uh, average winter pressure, You've got your highs coming right across here, your subtropical ridge, as that moves north and south through the seasons. You know, in summer it's further south, so you don't get so many uh, winter-type storms hitting the southwest. In winter that moves further north, and you do start to get some of those systems coming through. Quite dramatic systems, bringing you know, quite good rainfall. But if that were to shift in a climatological sense, which is what's being projected further south, then you're just not going to get as many storms. We can um, average that right around, uh, right around Antarctica, right around the globe, sorry, the hemisphere, and uh, we can produce a um, measure called the southern annular mode. What have I got on the next slide? Yes, southern annular mode. And so that's the average right around the hemisphere at the latitude of 45 degrees south compared to that at the latitude 70 degrees south. So we make up this index to really give us an indication of how the jet to our south is shifting around, and it does. It, it vacillates north and south, and that affects the pressure in our region and how far north the storms will reach. And so when the southern annular mode index is in a positive state, it means that pressures in our region are higher and the storms don't hit us as often. And I had a look at the uh, trends in that since 1970, and I can see in summer we have a very strong trend towards that positive uh, state of the southern annular mode, and uh, also in winter, um, which some people sort of don't really talk about as much because the summer trend is linked to the ozone hole. And so we're saying, OK, uh, because of that, it, it's going up. Maybe as the ozone hole um, closes over time, it may ease off this trend towards increasing pressures in this region. But it's also happening in winter, and that is the greenhouse gas forced signature. So that is a really robust signature, why there's more drying here and why it will continue into the future. How does that actually impact on a local scale? This is from a paper back in 2007, which I, I often refer back to because I think it really highlights the response to this shift to a higher uh, southern annular mode index. If we have a look here in winter, you can see your anomalies of wind are now in an easterly direction. So that doesn't mean there's easterly winds necessarily, but it just means that if there are westerly winds, they're not as strong. There may even be some easterly winds. And so if you have that direction of flow sort of weakening what's coming in from the west, you're going to get drying, certainly along there in Perth and along that west coast. But here, you actually have more interaction with the ocean and you're actually getting a little bit more rainfall from 
that shift to the higher. So, you know, it's kind of protecting you from this large scale increase in pressure because of the circulation shifts in the region. There's actually this little tiny bit of green here, which is very encouraging. If we think about the summer temperatures, so this is the correlation between the high southern, well, between the southern annular mode and summer daily maximum temperatures. And you can see an even more distinct shift across the region. And so you get that warming here because you've got that easterly kind of flow. You've got onshore uh, warm winds coming um, over to the west coast. And you've got this cooling here. And so that got me to thinking that, you know, this trend in the southern annular mode, although it's going to increase pressures everywhere and generally reduce the number of storms coming through, on a local scale it can have um, regional, differing regional impacts. And so back to that map of the uh, trend in maximum temperature. If we have a look now, coming to October 2015, what's just been happening? I just thought I'd have a quick chat about that. And I think I'm going to finish early, so there you go. <laughs> um, so this map is rather dramatic, I think. That very deep red here, here is lowest on record, and you can see right around here, and much of Tasmania, lowest on record, but right across Australia, we're getting very much below uh, average rainfall. High pressures everywhere, averaged across October. I find this just astonishing. As I was saying, that, that um, trend in spring has not really been evident until the last three years. And, and now, I don't quite know what's happening in spring, but it's certainly going to be an interesting topic of research for me and my colleagues, I think, in the years to come. Uh, so this pattern of pressure change is quite dramatic, positive everywhere, with anomalies of plus seven hectopascals. So that's quite a lot. And of course, the corresponding temperature decile map is, is a different colour scale. Here you have the deep orange is the highest on record, and it's covering more than half of the country. And that's just... Anyway, so what's going on? Well, it's an El Nino year, and so that affects a lot of Australia. Brings us uh, dry, warm conditions in general. Uh, and it is off the scale. Nino 4, which is this area in the Pacific over here, sort of closest to our region in the yellow, is at its highest weekly value on record at 30.3 degrees, which is uh, 1.7 degrees above average, which in the tropics is a big difference. And uh, you can see that it's really, um, really, really the highest ever. In terms of what's going on in the Indian Ocean, which can have impacts on Australia, of course. The Indian Ocean Dipole, which is this um, dipole of cooler waters to our northwest compared with warmer waters further out in the uh, Indian Ocean. And that setup generally brings a decrease um, in the warm, moist air that might bring rainfall across uh, Australia. And at the moment, in that positive phase, uh, the Indian Ocean is currently positive. That will break down at the uh, middle to end of this month and uh, as the Indian Asian monsoon begins and so that influence will um, generally break down and uh, the projections, sorry not the projections, the seasonal forecast for November to January is actually for very wet conditions in this part of the world. So you know it's really interesting this interaction between the large-scale shifts in uh, the enhanced carbon dioxide, the state of the surrounding oceans, the Pacific, the Indian, and also the Southern Ocean. And uh, one thing I was saying, the Pacific Ocean is the warmest on record. The Indian Ocean is also. So if we're looking at a uh, area in the Southern Indian Ocean, so from the equator to 60 degrees south, 30 to 120 degrees east in that box, it's the warmest on record, 0.65 degrees warmer than uh, the base period of 1981 to 2010. So those um, warming Indian Oceans, even though uh, way back when the Indian Ocean Climate Initiative started, we sort of thought that actually the interaction with the Indian Ocean didn't seem as strong as with um, just 
just the weather systems randomly coming across. We're now learning more and more that actually the interaction between the Indian Ocean and the Southern Ocean really can alter the impacts in this region and there's lots of room for further research. Thank you.